Uh, hi there, ladies and gentlemen. This is Olusha Yukami of Nusa Capital. Coming to you on this Monday evening after so many announcements concerning COVID-19. More and more cities across the planet are now on lockdown. Well, we've been on lockdown since last week. And um, people are kind of you know, even though people are not showing it, people are a little bit nervous underneath it. When you talk to people sometimes, they're kind of worried about how long is this going to go on. I think that the government are trying to keep everybody calm through the continued um, functioning of the supply chain. i got to admit there's a little bit of rationing going on, but... Perhaps more importantly of this whole thing is the fact that no one's really sure what's going to go on. And with all the current social control, you know, we have to stay in the house, social distancing and all that stuff, you know, God knows what's going to happen when, you know, we come out on the other side. I mean, you've already got reports that COVID-19 has helped reduce air pollution because people are not as active in some countries, you know. We also saw some pictures showing the canal areas of Milan not really having anybody around. Therefore, the um, birds and other wildlife are beginning to appear in the area. But perhaps um, most importantly, as I said, we must uh, put in the back of our minds that how we live, how we eat, invest in trade, socialize, travel, all that's going to change. Our styles of interactions are going to change. A lot of things are not going to be the same. A lot of things are not going to be the same. This pandemic is going to change our lives completely. I think human beings being what we are, we're going to try to do the best we can getting back to being as active and as functional as possible but there's going to be something in our psyche probably at the back of our minds anyway today I as I thought what I've just said as I was thinking it kind of reminded me of a book that I had seen that had been written I think I think it was written in 2015 by James Rickards or Jim Rickards as many people know him the guy who wrote The Death of Money and Currency Wars and he's released a book recently I, can't, I think it's Aftermath or something that I can't quite remember excuse me and this book, I had not really read this book that far. I was not feeling it. At the time that this book came, when I was trying to read it, I was not well at all. So I I think I just read about a couple of chapters and, you know, packed it in. But then I remember the introduction in this book. And I think many of you will find it fascinating. And the reason why you find it fascinating is because with this, um, this pandemic and the changes to our lives that this pandemic is going to bring about, one could easily see where things could lead. For instance, for those of you going on about government control, well, we're relying on the government. We're turning to the government to say, hey, help us. So we can never, never, ever ignore government, regardless of what some people are saying. The conspiracy theorists are also going to, going to overdrive on this one. But I thought I should read the introduction of this book to you. So in this particular segment, I think I'm only going to read about half of it, the first half. And then I'm going to do a second video with the second half of what I want to read to you. And um, the introduction of the, as I said, the book is called The Big Drop. How to Grow Your Wealth During the Coming Collapse. You know, So that's an interesting um, title to start with. <coughs> Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, my apologies. Anyway, here's the introduction. The introduction is titled Introduction in the Year 2024. 
The following describes a fictional dystopia in the spirit of Brave New World on 1984. It is not a firm forecast or prediction in the usual analytical sense. Instead, it's intended to provide warning and encourage readers to be alert to dangerous trends in society, some of which are already in place. As I woke this morning, Sunday, October 13, 2024, from restless dreams, I found the insect-sized sensor implanted in my arm was already awake. We call it a bug. US citizens have been required to have them since 2022 to access government health care. The bug knew from its biometric monitoring of my brain, of my brain wave frequencies and rapid eye movement, that I would awake momentarily. It was already at work launching systems, including the coffee maker. I could smell the coffee brewing in the kitchen. The information screens on the inside of my panoptical goggles were already flashing before my eyes. Images of world leaders were on the screen. They were issuing proclamations about the fine health of their economies and the advent of world peace. Citizens, they explained, needed to work in accordance with the New World Order Growth Plan to maximize wealth for all. I knew this was propaganda, but I couldn't ignore it. Removing your panopticon goggles is viewed with suspicion by the neighborhood watch committees. Your bug controls all the channels. I'm mostly interested in economics and finance, as I have been for decades. I've told the central authorities that I'm an economic historian, so they gave me access to archives and information denied to most citizens in the name of national economic security. My work now is only historical because markets were abolished after the panic of 2018. That was not the original intent of the authorities. They meant to close markets temporarily to stop the panic. But once the markets were shut, there was no way to reopen them without the panic starting again. Today, trust in markets is completely gone. All, invest, all investors want is their money back. Authorities started printing money after the panic of 2008, but that solution stopped working by 2018. Probably because so much had been printed in 2017 under QE7. When the panic hit, money was viewed as worthless, so markets were simply closed. Between 2018 to 2020, the group of 20 major powers, the G20, abolished all currencies except for the dollar, the euro, and the Ruasia. The dollar became the local currency in North and South America. Europe, Africa, and Australia used the euro. The Ruasia was the only new currency, a combination of the old Russian ruble, Chinese yuan, and Japanese yen, and was adopted as the local currency in Asia. There is also new world money called Special Drawing Rights, or SDRs for short. They are used only for settlements between countries, however. Everyday citizens use the dollar, euro, or Russia for daily transactions. The SDR is also used to set energy prices and as a benchmark for the value of the three local currencies. The World Central Bank, formerly the IMF, administers the SDR system under the direction of the G20. As a result of the fixed exchange rates, there is no currency trading. All of the gold in the world was confiscated in 2020 and placed in a nuclear bomb-proof vault dug into the Swiss Alps. The mountain vault had been vacated by the Swiss Army and made available to the World Central Bank for this purpose. All G20 nations contributed their national gold to the vault. All private gold 
was forcibly confiscated and added to the Swiss vault as well. All gold mining had been nationalised and suspended on environmental grounds. The purpose of the Swiss vault was not to have gold backing for currencies, but rather to remove gold from the financial system entirely, so it could never be used as money again. Thus, gold trading ceased because its production, use and position were banned. By these means, the G20 and the World Central Bank controlled the only forms of money. Some lucky ones had purchased gold in 2014 and sold it when it reached $40,000 per ounce in 2019. By then, inflation was out of control and the power elites knew that all confidence in paper currencies had been lost. The only way to re-establish control of money was to confiscate gold. But those who sold near the top were able to purchase land or art which authorities did not confiscate. Those who never owned gold in the first place saw their savings, retirement incomes, pensions and insurance policies turn to dust once the hyperinflation began. Now it seems so obvious. The only way to preserve wealth through the panic of 2018 was to have gold, land and fine art. But investors not only need to have the foresight to buy it, they also had to be nimble enough to sell the gold before the confiscation in 2020 and then buy more land and art and hang on to it. For that reason, many lost everything. Land and personal property were, confisc were not confiscated, beg your pardon, because much of it was needed for living arrangements and agriculture. Personal property was too difficult to confiscate and of little use to the state. Fine art was lumped in with cheap art and mundane personal property and ignored. Stock and bond trading were halted when the markets closed. During the panic selling after the crash of 2018, stocks were wiped out. The value of all bonds were wiped out in the hyperinflation of 2019. Governments closed stock and bond markets nationalized all corporations and declared a moratorium on all debts. World leaders initially explained it as an effort to buy time to come up with a plan to unfreeze the markets. But over time they realized that trust and confidence had been permanently destroyed and there was no point in trying. Wiped out savers broke out in money riots soon after but were quickly suppressed by militarized police who used drones, night vision technology, body armor, and electronic surveillance. Highway toll booth digital scammers were used to spot and interdict those who tried to flee by car. By 2017, the US government required censors on all cars. It was all too easy for officials to turn off the engines of those who were government targets, spot their locations, and arrest them on the side of the road. In compensation for citizens' wealth destroyed by inflation and confiscation, governments distributed digital social units called social shares and social donations. These were based on a person's previous wealth. Americans below a certain level of wealth called social shares that entitled them to a guaranteed income. Those above a certain level of wealth got social donation units that required them to give their wealth to the state. Over time, the result was the redistribution of wealth so that everyone had about the same net worth and the same standard of living. The French economist Thomas Piketty was the principal consultant to the G20 and World Central Bank on this project. To facilitate the gradual freezing of markets, confiscation of wealth and creation of social units, world governments coordinated the animation of cash in 2016. The cashless society was sold to citizens as a convenience. No more dirty, grubby coins and bills to carry around. Instead, you could pay with smart cards and mobile phones and could transfer funds online. Only when the elimination of cash was complete did citizens realize 
that digital money meant total control by government. This made it easy to adopt former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers' ideas of negative interest rates. Governments simply deducted amounts from its citizens' bank accounts every month. Without cash, there was no way to prevent the digital deductions. The government could also monitor all your transactions and digitally freeze, you, freeze your account if you disagreed with their tax or monetary policy. In fact, a new category of hate crime for thoughts against monetary policy was enacted by executive order. The penalty was digital elimination of wealth of those guilty of dissent. The entire process unfolded in small stages so that investors and citizens barely noticed before it was too late. Gold had been the best way to preserve wealth from 2014 to 2018, but in the end, it was confiscated because the power elites knew it could not be allowed. First, they eliminated cash in 2016. Then they eliminated diverse currencies and stocks in 2018. Finally came the hyperinflation of 2019, which wiped out most wealth, followed by gold confiscation and the digital socialism of 2020. By last year, 2023, free markets, private property and entrepreneurship were things of the past. All that remains of wealth is land, fine art, and some illegal gold. The only other valuable assets are individual talents, provided you can deploy them outside the system of state-approved jobs. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll stop there for the moment. And as I said, there's going to be a part two because there's a bit more to be read to you. You know, it begs the question, what would happen if this whole virus pandemic went on for much longer than we anticipated or expected? What then? Will, will our governments put in, you know, more controls? I mean, no one really knows. I mean, we don't know what any government can do. I mean, ask yourself a simple question. What would your government do? You know, what would my government do? What would any government do? We don't know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I must continue to emphasize that this is a purely, uh, this is purely uh, an intellectual exercise. And everything's based on hypotheticals, of course. There's no conspiracy here. I don't, I don't subscribe to conspiracy theories. But with the current state of affairs, any thinking person can and should wonder about what could, or should I say, what may or may not happen. As I always say to you, at the conclusion of all my blogs, or at least most of them, your guess is as good as mine. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your evening. And I'll see you in part two.